Here's your host, Alex Garrett. I'm Alex Garrett, and welcome inside to this Saturday sit-down with my next guest. I've been really hoping to have him on for quite a while now, to be honest with you. Uh, Tom Rogan. And Tom, I know you just got off the set of the McLaughlin Group, and you're you're running that podcast today. And, and yes, the McLaughlin Group is alive and well. We do miss John, right, Tom? We do miss John McLaughlin, but you're carrying the torch now. Well, you, you know, of course we do, and he's irreplaceable. But, um, you know, it's very kind of you, Alex, to have me on and, uh, you know, to be able to talk about the issues as well. And, and hopefully in some sense I can not fill his shoes but uh, continue the tradition of, of having, um, you know, the people, friends who disagree agreeably, as, as we say on the show, on matters of great national import at this, you know, time in our politics where people – struggle to disagree agreeably well i think you guys still have the format that he wanted to he created he had legendary on cbs for 30 years you guys still have that you've got the you know uh clifton and you've got uh buchanan you've got the names the regulars that were on there to this day so congratulations on keeping that alive well thank you yeah you know and i think you know the 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 the, the, the credit there goes to those panelists in the sense that they you know, wanted to keep um, doing what they do and, and hopefully contributing to the public discourse. And and ultimately, you know, they're just very passionate about their beliefs. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to, to be part of the little uh, cabal that we have going on. Tom and Tom Rogan. Now, you also write for the Washington Examiner to this day, right? Have you still kept that gig as well? I do, yeah. So I'm still with the Examiner, uh, mainly writing on foreign policy for them, yeah. And so, and obviously, with you're British, so you're following Brexit to this day, I'm sure as well. And what's going on over yeah, there? So, yeah. So my my father. So I have dual citizenship. My father was in the State Department, and my mother is British. Um, but you know, certainly, having grown up in the UK, um, you know, Brexit is something I'm I'm definitely uh, keenly following. Well, let let's stick stateside for a moment. We just had Super Tuesday, and. Everybody knows that Joe Biden had this incredible comeback, and I don't agree with calling it a coup. Many have on the, you know, conspiracy waves. I hope you're not calling it that. I mean, I don't see it as a coup. I just see that people wanted to stop Bernie Sanders' train from rolling along. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. You know, I think, you know, there has been a coalescence of um, the candidates and their reflective supporters. Uh, towards a candidate that they feel better aligns with where they want the 2020 Democratic nominee and their platform to stand. And so, you know, I, I agree with you in terms of it's unfair to say that it's some kind of IQ. I think it's simply a reflection of um, people deciding that uh, Joe Biden reflects their sort of point of view more than, you know, more than others do. Now, I would kind of be disappointed if Elizabeth Warren back Joe Biden, because I do feel like she and Sanders, and she's complimented Sanders often on the trail, and I just feel like if she does that, it proves she's worried about losing the establishment support for her Senate seat in Massachusetts. That's why she Joe back Joe Biden. I just think that would look fake uh, for what she's been promoting on her trail. Yeah, and, and I think also with Elizabeth Warren, you know, that there is an interest in maintaining relevance and import influence in uh, the next Democratic administration, which, you know, obviously she will hope a Democrat defeats President Trump. And and to uh, I think her calculation has to be, well, who is more likely now to beat President Trump? And, you know, if it's Joe Biden, as much as she disagrees with some of his platform, were she to throw her support behind him in, in a very serious way, uh, then I think she would have more, you know, but, you know, she would have good off, a good hope of potentially, you know, being really quite an influential player in terms of the direction of that administration, um, you know, were he to be elected and, and take office on January 20th, 2020. Tom, 2021, yeah. I think we all watched Bernie Sanders in the background when he endorsed Hillary and he looked pretty ticked off that he was doing so. Uh, could we see that same situation here or will he stick it out to the convention? In ter- do, you, do you mean in terms of Bernie? Uh, yeah, could he endorse Joe? Biden before the convention if he sees that there's no path, or does he stick with this through the convention? Well, I mean that's the great debate point, right? I mean it is, you know, it's not at all clear what he would decide to do, and Democrats are worried about that. They fear a situation in which the party 
uh, transitions from the convention into what is very likely to be a very tough contest with President Trump uh, and are disunited. And, you know, if that is to happen um, and Sanders supporters are to stay home, uh, it's going to be very, very hard for the Democrats to to uh, unseat the president. And so, you know, I guess we'll we'll wait and see is the is the easy but the best answer. Um, but at the moment, you know, I think there's more acrimony growing behind the scenes, and I think Sanders truly believes it's his time. He's entitled to it, and you know, I I, th- I think it's very possible that he would refuse to endorse. I would I would see that happening as well, considering that he looked miserable doing so in 16 when the DNC clearly rigged it against him for Hillary. Uh, and I do right. believe and that was fact and not a conspiracy theory, to be honest with you and to be upfront. Right. And with his age, you know, you've got to think that there's likely uh, more likely than not that he would be um, deciding this is his last campaign. And, you know, how does he want to leave? Does he want to leave as someone who you know, eventually, as some of his supporters would see it, count out to the establishment by supporting Joe or went out um, politically, at least, as someone who stood for what they believed in and refused to support what he believes is a democratic establishment that is too far to the right. It would be like a fool me once, fool me twice kind of thing, right? Like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Then it would really be Bernie looking also kind of fake on his principles if he does back Biden. Exactly. I think that's a very fair assessment. Now, we, you keep bringing up President Trump, and I'm glad you do because it sets me up for this next idea, which is in conservative circles it's being talked about, but still not acknowledged by the mainstream that I could see, is that he had an amazing Super Tuesday. He's you know, doubled, tripled what the incumbents have gotten in previous primaries, and that's something to keep an eye on, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a good point, Alex. If you look at it in terms of his... You know, getting these people to turn out in effectively uncontested primaries, it shows the degree to which his base is extremely loyal, extremely happy with what he has done, uh, and you know, determined to ensure that he gets four more years. And so, you know, I think that's something that Democrats, you know, at least in terms of the planning uh, elements of the party behind the scenes, are aware of. Um, it's certainly something that motivates the decision to coalesce around Biden because they believe Biden is. You know, a better candidate to take on President Trump and win, um, but you know, this is going to be this is going to be a very close run election, I think. Now, you know, I, I kind of label this as a categorized cultural societal podcast, and maybe you can agree with me that President Trump made politics a cultural and societal podcast with all his viewpoints and with the outrage. And to his credit, I, I love that he's brought politics to people's eyes and ears, because before 2015, no one even cared what was going on in our government. Yeah, I mean, it's true. And, and you know, the, 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 the people like us who would you know, have always been, you know, interested in it in, in terms of our attention uh, are the exception to the rule. And there are a lot of folks, obviously, who, you know, d- didn't feel engaged. And, and the president, whether you like the way in which he's engaged them or dislike it, certainly has engaged them. And just the same dynamic could be said of Bernie Sanders in many ways. And this, this sort of populist momentum that kind of uh, defines both those candidacies has been shown to have quite a lot of political saliency uh, and, you know, has shaken things up. And, and, and I, I, I think I agree with you that, you know, shaking things up and getting people engaged in and of itself is a positive thing. Um, you know, it's up to politicians uh, to make a case as to why their ideas are better and, you know, more moral or have more expedient interest in the public good, etc., but ultimately, if if you are having people inspired to sort of engage with the political process in a way they haven't done before, there, there's something, I think, quite wholly good about that. And Tom, and Tom Rogan, the now moderator of the McLaughlin Group and a columnist at the Washington Examiner. And as we're talking, I'm thinking, you know, your show is an hour long. It's also on Westwood One Radio. And so... For the hour long, it wasn't all about Super Tuesday for you guys this week, right? I mean, coronavirus. What other topics were you guys covering? So this week we did uh, Super Tuesday, and we talked about the coronavirus fallout. How is the administration handling that? Uh, and then we had a little discussion on the U.S. Taliban uh, peace deal and on uh, the minor- Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer's comments on the Supreme Court was specifically on Senate, uh, on Supreme Court Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh in terms of his, um, what some said was a threat, which he sort of pared back, 
uh, that uh, they wouldn't know what it would hit them if they voted as he does, as Senator Schumer does not wish in terms of an upcoming abortion case. So, you know, we tried to cover the various bases. It's obviously a, um, a you know, it's a time where there are a lot of different news stories going on. Um, but we want to try and balance covering as many stories as we can with the idea of uh, covering um, stories in such a way that there's a, d- a deeper discussion than perhaps you would find on on some other television shows that are politically focused. And that's that's kind of why I, I'm getting tired of the Sunday shows in general. I feel like they are covered on one fat, one tracked mind. They have one group of people, which is the, the people established. They don't have newer voices, and that's why I turn to you guys, because, yes, you guys have uh, the same crew, but there's still new voices, and that you barely hear from them elsewhere, right? I mean, I know Pappy Cannon is still out there, but you bring in voices that, that maybe people haven't heard from in the... Well, I appreciate that's kind of you to say, you know, that's what we're trying to do, is to make sure that we reflect the, you know, the diversity of the political landscape in terms of commentators, and, and, and do it in such a way that it comes off the back of this baseline of, you know, established figures who uh, people know and have read for many years. And, and hopefully in that way, we can balance tradition to um, modernity, as it were, in terms of the discussion. But you know, I appreciate you saying that. So, and the Schumer thing really, I mean, it's horrible what he said. Actually, can I play it? Tell you, Gorsuch. I want to tell you, Kavanaugh. You have released the whirlwind, and you will pay the price. And the comments coming up right now. Hang on with it. You won't know what hit you. I mean, look. To me, at, at the first point, it um, it's a comment that yes, conservatives will jump on. Not everybody will understand, or not. Everybody will jump on, but sure enough, they did. And for Jeff, Chief Justice Roger Roberts to even rebuke him was a big deal. But when you think about it, Tom, there are, have been instances where I remember when Justice Kennedy retired, they were harassing him at his retire. You know, at the, at the lunch he had after announcing it because they didn't want to see uh, Trump pick judges. So his comment really could be a dog whistle to those who might want to take extreme mes- measures. Yeah, and this is the challenge, and I think that's why you did see Senator Schumer back away from it, perhaps not as explicitly as some would have liked. Uh, but, but you know, this is a time where there is a lot of political toxicity in terms of uh, the fringes. And so, you know, it was an inappropriate remark, I think most people would say, for Senator Schumer to make. Um, and I think, you know, Justice Chief Justice Roberts, uh, as he has done once before with President Trump in terms of a comment, uh, the president made about the court, or the courts per se, decided that he had to step in and, and say, "Listen, this is, you know, the, the law cannot exist in uh, an ecosystem where uh, threats uh, against um, the provision of justice and rulings uh, it becomes the norm." And and so, you know, it was a significant story. I thought in that regard. Well, and uh, and I thought people in the conservative circles covered it really well, and. Uh, and we shall see. I don't think he's going to get censured, but you know that if a Republican said this, he may be more than censured on the Senate floor. That's oh, where yeah. everybody's ticked off at the double standard here. Yeah, and then you know this, this is something though that uh, you know is you learn to sort of accept it and, and and to try and deal with it in terms of presenting your own arguments and and doing good reporting. I think as a conservative journalist, but but it's certainly true that. that the majority of the media, in in the significant majority of the media, is more predisposed towards um, democratic interests, and you know that, uh, as you say, the reaction to Schumer's comments uh, was quite different, I think, than what it would have been had uh, those comments come from a Democratic or a Republican member towards a um, a leaning liberal member of the court uh, so you know there is that dichotomy and approach but it's i think i guess it's something that you know we just um it's the reality unfortunately right and you know i i was watching the screens a couple of weeks ago when even uh sort of mayor came out with a you know her passionate uh trying to defend the court but also saying you know 
these guys are politically appointed and all that. And I do agree in the tone that she wrote it that she should recuse herself from cases involving Trump if she's going to have that bias walking into cases. Would you agree? Well, you know, the, the, the challenge is that – so I'm sort of of a mixed mind about this. I think, you know, she is a Supreme Court justice. Inherently, stuff that gets to the Supreme Court is going to be political in some way uh, for or against President Trump's interests. But uh, I think Supreme Court justices should hold themselves um, to a level in which they don't, as Sotomayor uh, did, uh, engage in some of the more partisan um, – you know, circumspection. I think Justice Elena Kagan uh, is a very good example of a, a liberal justice who, you know, adapts the correct approach in terms of you know, by her rulings, uh, by her votes uh, on cases, seems to be very skeptical of the administration, but doesn't engage in some of the more obviously partisan rhetoric that uh, Justice Sotomayor does. But, you know, of course, each justice is their own person. And I'm, as we're talking, I'm just thinking to myself, how come Schumer wasn't threatening any of the judges when they voted 9-0 on the third travel ban that the Trump administration was working to get approved? I mean, they saw we had to limit travel to a certain extent, and they all voted unanimously on that one, yet that got no coverage at all. Yeah, and, and you know, again, this, this, this comes down to uh, a fact that media editors, media voices uh, tend to be more predisposed to... Um, those who don't like the president. And so it's, it's you know, it's, it's a function of that reality in the end. I don't know if you guys covered this on this week's McLaughlin Group where you've been thinking about writing something on it, but uh, in the media we saw Chris Matthews have to resign this week, and there's probably something deeper than what he said on the air. But I thought that it came after some timing calling out Sanders. I thought that was a very weird timing, considering he just called out Bernie Sanders and had been under fire for what he called, you know, an invasion like the Nazis, which I think is extreme. But even so, we saw society react, and now he's he's reacting by resigning. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think what happened with him is that he... Um, you know, the comments that he'd made a few years ago about the female journalist that was on uh, the show with him uh, certainly didn't help. But I think MSNBC eventually decided that, you know, primarily that reason in terms of his comments about the, the female journalist, but then uh, his comments about Bernie Sanders, you know, they I think they probably saw it as an opportunity to get rid of him. And I don't know what they're going to do, whether they move in a you know different direction or, you know, new face. You know, the TV business is quite well. It is cutthroat, and and so, you know, some of his comments. I think he would probably, in private, be the first to say, you know, perhaps I was treated unfairly in terms of the totality, in terms of the result of losing my show. But, you know, ultimately, it's it's a it's a brave new world, and at some point, you know, if you're representing a network, you've you've got to, you know, you've got to sort of toe the line, and and you know. Uh, that, that was the conundrum that he found himself in in terms of um, being someone who was always given a, a, a wide latitude to say what he wanted to say um, and being paired back by the NBC News administration. Now, uh, one quick question for you, Tom. You do your national radio show with the McLaughlin Group. I do this podcast and have been on all these different outlets. But it does make you wonder, like, if you say the wrong thing, those outlets could be taken away from you immediately. So... What's your advice to those uh, wanting to voice their opinion, but wanting maybe we should think about what we say before we say it? Is that what we're seeing become more evident here as the Matthews has resigned? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's something that I actually talked with some members of the um, McLaughlin Group's the production crew uh, the other day with about in terms of you know okay, what jokes can you make, uh, what things can you say, do you you know, uh, have to worry about um, how things might be uh, misperceived in terms of what you say. And ultimately, I think what it comes down to is, is you know, saying things that you would be able to justify uh, to, you know, friends and acquaintances you know, after you say them. And, and you can't put it in a position where you're constantly hesitating before you say something, because that would take away, you know, the, the power of the your political you know, analysis, message, rhetoric, but also your individuality as someone, you know, the, the humor, uh, the ability to be 
you know, an individual as it were. And so it's, I think, about balancing, um, you know, do you really mean what you're going to say? And if you do, just go with your gut. And, and you know, you're going to get criticism and people say you said something you know, wrong at some point. That will happen. But, but ultimately, I think you have to be true to yourself. And that that's, uh, I think, the best and only metric you can apply if you're serious about retaining your, you know, commentary and analysis in an environment where it is, uh, where political correctness and where, you know, the, the impulse to be offended is, is growing. I feel like every word of everything out there is now scrutinized. I mean, the Astros thing didn't happen. Uh, you know, the Astros thing happened because they scrutinized what a guy said to a newspaper. I, I don't know. I feel like everything is so under scrutiny more so than we've ever seen before. Every word, to, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I mean, certainly we are in an era in which uh, there is uh, a great degree of uh, scrutiny about you know words and actions, and some of that is positive, but some of it is you know ultimately just quite extreme and just designed to um, keep people saying what certain other people want them to say, and and so you know again balance and and um, and attention to. In you know, true beliefs, I think, is the best way of dealing with it. Tom, you deal with foreign policy, so i got to ask you this because I feel like it is a foreign policy issue here on the home front. While Schumer's comments were under you know, investigation, under scrutiny, under criticism, Trump cuts with you know, funding from sanctuary cities. I feel like I'm in one in New York City. We are a self-proclaimed sanctuary city. And I say, you know what? I'm glad he's doing this because we have to hold our liberal extremist cities accountable. Would you agree with that move he did this week that really went under the radar uh, on many fronts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it is um, ultimately the tradition of American jurisprudence and constitutional democracy is that uh, the federal government on, on matters of, you know, that, that affect, you know, move across state borders, they're the supreme authority. Clearly, the federal government has made a determination that it wants to move to uh, remove people from the country, illegal immigrants who uh, it is regarded as being in breach of the law. If state and local governments refuse to comply with that, they should have no expectation in my mind of receiving the dividends of the federal government, which is to say, in this case, federal revenue, federal grants. And so, you know, I think it was the right decision. And, and I also think it's as much as the left and some of the media presented as an extreme decision, it's actually something that the most, you know, that most Americans agree with, that, that you know, even in many Democrats, that this is this is not really serious, that if, if, a, if a state and local government is refusing to assist the federal government in doing what the federal government has evident constitutional authority to do, then quite a basic and quite a mild, quite frankly, uh, response to that is to restrict those governments uh, at the state and local level from receiving uh, federal monies. Cuomo likes to fight uh, Trump on almost everything that he does for, against states like ours. And I just think that's kind of funny considering that uh, he's putting more stock in and okay, yeah, seventy-six confirmed cases is alarming, but he really doesn't uh, of coronavirus to declare emergency here. But I feel like he doesn't put stock in the regular American New York State citizen as much as he should. And and I feel like if you're going to declare this emergency for coronavirus, well, why not declare an emergency then for the millions impacted by subways? Why not? You know, he could focus on other issues as well and declare something more severe and act quicker on those issues as well. Yeah, you know, you probably know more about New York politics than I do, but it, it certainly seems that, um, you know, the, the, one of the opportunities perhaps for Republicans and conservatives to articulate the idea, as in San Francisco, for example, where you have, uh, you know, very significant amount of revenue flowing into the government coffers and very significant problems in terms of the delivery of basic services and, and the environment. Um so, you know, it is, I think, important to push back against politicians where they jump on a bandwagon instead of addressing the nuts and bolts issues uh, that people have been complaining about for a long time. And uh, those nuts and bolts literally keep the city running just like it keeps the metro running, you know, down in D.C. So it's very similar in that regard. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and again, accountability for how government spends its money and where it spends it is, is critical to the functioning of a uh, successful democracy. And, you know, maybe it requires both politicians.
politicians and, and commentators and observers to stand up and and call out the failings of government because if government failings aren't called out, uh, you eventually move into uh, a system in which government failing and cronyism are expected and accepted. And, and that is, uh, I think, a perverse situation for any uh, democracy that aims to to provide a, a good life to its citizens. Tom, I followed you the Washington Examiner. I remember I forwarded you my, you know, my little clip on when I highlighted one of your stories, actually, in the Examiner. We've been in touch ever since. And then when I saw you hosting the McLaughlin Group, I said, wow, this is, this is going to be awesome. And, and you've proved me right. So congratulations on that. And one more thing, because I think you still do it on the podcast, as much as I've heard, the predictions. You know, John McLaughlin was all about the predictions before the end of the show. So give me your prediction on coronavirus, especially that, since it's growing. Does it shut down everything in New York, everything around the world, or do we get it under control? That's my question for you, for your prediction. Well, thank you. I, I, I think we, to a degree, we get it under control. I think will, it will continue to grow in the short term. But if you look at the lethality rates and the degree to which it is spread in places where really it is in every city, for example, Italy, uh, there is still a containment factor that is applicable. And, and so hopefully that will be uh, the norm in the United States. I think the doomsday predictions uh, are wrong. And I, I think it just scares us even more. All right, Tom, where can we follow you and where can we follow the show? Yeah, so uh, if people want to follow the show, they can go to um, McLaughlin.com. Um, my uh, writing for it, the Washington Examiner. Uh, just Google Tom Rogan, Washington Examiner, and I'm on Twitter at uh, Tom R. Tweets. And there you go. We will we will talk to you soon. We'll have you back. And uh, thank you for the invitation down to D.C. I will definitely do what I can to make it down there before, uh, you know, summer or during the summer. I'll, I'll definitely stop by and see what's going on. With Great. You guys. So thanks hey, we'll again. We look forward to seeing you. Thanks again, Tom Rogan. And I'm Alex Garrett. And as John McLaughlin would end every Sunday edition of the McLaughlin Group. Out of time. Bye bye. Bye.